Hello and welcome to the News Laundry News Minute election coverage. Joining me today is uh, Professor Rajiv Gowda, who is contesting from Bengaluru North constituency. So thank you so much for talking to us. What is uh, yes. what is different this time around in Karnataka? The last time uh, uh, you won the uh, uh, assembly elections with a huge uh, number. So this time around, what has changed? The number of assembly segments that we're going to lead in has probably increased much more. That, and this is because what we have done in the last 10 months is we've implemented the five guarantees that we promised before the assembly elections. The um, Anna Bhagya, the extra 5 kgs of rice per person, the Graha Lakshmi, 2,000 rupees per woman head of household, the free electricity through Graha Jyoti, the free travel for women through Shakti, and um, the UNED program, which provides a subsidy for our um, uh, for our uh, youth, okay, unemployed youth. So all of these have really touched the minds and hearts and stomachs of our people. They're really, really very happy and even grateful. And um, that's one of the key factors across the state. There is a groundswell of support for a party that has lived up to its promises and that has demonstrated that it really cares for the difficulties that people have been going through during the 10 months, 10 years of Modi Sarkar. The price rise, unemployment, um, you know, these sorts of uh, women dropping out of the workforce, all these sorts of challenges that we've seen. Um, in, in 10 years, the central BJP government has only inflicted pain on people. In 10 months, we have alleviated the pain of our people and taken care of them where it matters. So, uh, uh, the BJP says that uh, all this Congress ki guarantee, uh, the Modi's guarantee will uh, trump all this, all, all the guarantees that is being given by the Congress. Yeah, so the basic challenge is for Mr. Modi is one of credibility. Right? You remember his election promises, the jumlas of 15 lakhs per person, the two, two crore jobs a year, etc. None of those have been fulfilled. So people may, you know, listen to these speeches, but they don't believe a word. That's really what makes the difference between Modi's copycat effort at offering guarantees and um, our actual um, implementation of the same. People believe us. And, uh, uh, you know, you haven't won a seat. The Congress hasn't won a seat in Bengaluru for a very long time. What ha what do you think has changed now? The people of Bengaluru have been um, very, very upset with the state BJP government in the previous uh, regime, right? And even though the assembly election results didn't give us the kind of uh, results in Bengaluru city, people have realized that it was a mistake. And uh, this time... The, uh, in addition to the traditional vote ba base of the Congress, we also have um, a wonderful team Bengaluru. The candidates that the Congress party has fielded in Bengaluru, um, you know, Saumya Reddy, who is an activist and a very effective MLA earlier uh, in South, um, our educationist friend Mansur Ali Khan in Central, and uh, myself, in the professor politician in um, in North, and then of course we have uh, D.K. Suresh in Bengaluru. That's some three assembly segments of the city fall into his constituency, and uh, so people say, "Wow, this is a wonderful team, a team that can be relied upon to bring in central government grants to fight for the voice of uh, and the interests of Karnataka." In Delhi, unlike the 25 dummy BJP MPs who we had elected in the previous um, in, the, in 2019, yeah. So, so this um, it's not just about me alone. It's about the entire team that the Congress has been uh, presenting to the people. People are very excited about us, and this is going to have a positive impact. Many, many people who would have otherwise voted for the BJP are telling me, for example, in North Bengaluru, that, hey, the candidate matters. We are going to vote for you. And look, it's just a matter of a couple of lakhs of people switching from their previous voting pattern to our side based on the candidates that we've uh, offered. Um, and we'll be home, you know, home and victorious. Okay. Yeah. And uh, talking about the manifesto, you were part of, uh, you know, the manifesto uh, team. 
previously and you were also um, you know part of uh, the Karnataka assembly election manifesto uh, prime minister narendra modi's recent speech about congress manifesto he calls congress manifesto a muslim league's manifesto and he also goes on to say that uh, uh, you know the congress has promised in its manifesto that uh, gold from other people will be taken away and it will be redistributed uh, so how do you uh, see the speech and what is your response to that Prime Minister's Prime Minister Modi's speech is brazenly communal. It is one of the worst speeches made by a Prime Minister of India. Someone who talks about sabke saath, sabke vikas, then goes ahead, you know, takes out and um, uh, you know, really, really twists what Dr. Manmohan Singh said, what the commitment of modern India has been to every citizen. He basically twists all that and tries to send out a communally charged message to his base of people uh, you know who thrive on hatred and division and um, and he's basically you know lying through his teeth and that's not new right and and basically he's, he's trying to provoke some kind of uh, uh, you know anger amongst people but people and you know this is karnataka this is you know sarva jananga the shanti athota this is a, a state that wants to be a peaceful garden of all religions that's what our vision is and people will not fall into this trap they all have obviously seen that we are not going to you know that but we don't do things on the basis of religion or caste we do it on the basis of people's economic needs we are do it on the basis of making sure you know, are our guarantees based on religion or um, uh, is our enforcement of law based on uh, religion or caste? No, we take care of everyone who is in need. And uh, the prime minister basically took, you know, various snippets of different uh, speeches by, say, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh in his time and twisted it and added the kind of, um, you know, the most negative poison to this. And um, and as you know, this is a speech that we are waiting for the election commission to take action on. This is the kind of speech that is prohibited. Hate speech. That's what it is. It is hate speech of the worst kind. And it's a shame that the prime minister of India indulges in it. It shows you how desperate he is, and he's sensing that it's time for his government and his party to sit in the opposition, and therefore he's trying to, you know, do the lowest possible rhetoric. That, uh, that that is, uh, everyone will condemn it. But a lot of youngsters, a lot of people seems to believe that kind of speech. You know, some people, you know, even in Bengaluru or, you know, people from uh, upper class backgrounds, they tend to believe those kind of speeches. What, what would you like to tell them? I think we now need to reach out to them and say, please, pay attention to what kind of India you want to live in. Do you want to live in an India where you know, the term fraternity that's in our preamble is, is, is actually meaningful, where we're all brothers and sisters, where we respect and celebrate our diversity and our respective religions. Or do you want one where it's always tension and hatred and violence and bulldozer justice, as they call it, and, you know, all kinds of things that are antithetical to the ethos of India, to the ethos of Hinduism itself. And uh, talking about uh, your uh, election in uh, Bengaluru North, you're taking on a BJP heavyweight uh, Shoba. How do you view her uh, politics over the years? You have been an, a Rajya Sabha MP too, so you must have closely uh, you know, watched or uh, observed her politics. What do you have to say about that? So we were in parliament together for six years. And um, I didn't see anything of note coming from Shobaka in parliament. Okay. On the other hand, if you ask people in the ruling party about my performance in the Rajya Sabha, they'll tell you the exact opposite. They'll tell you that they give me tremendous respect and that they've even changed laws based on my inputs. Okay, that's the kind of impact I've had. Mr. Shobaka may be a heavyweight to you, but heavyweight doing what? You know, say, someone say, called her a firebrand, a fire starter, someone who cannot see any situation without lighting a fire and trying to create division and uh, polarization. Uh, you remember her recent statement accusing people of Tamil Nadu of being terrorists. You know, what sort of nonsense is this? 
right? This is the, you know, if this is how she has built her political career, it's time to put an end to politics of that sort. It's time to defeat candidates who espouse those kinds of really, you know, hateful propaganda. And talking about polarization, uh, uh, you know, the, ne the Neha's murder in uh, Hubli uh, has become a talking point in this election. There's a lot of, uh, you know, a polarization surrounding that uh, issue. Do you think the Congress uh, has mit mishandled this uh, issue? This is an issue that is undergoing investigation. The perpetrator of that ghastly crime is in custody. There will be suitable action taken against him. I do not see any need to add a communal color or uh, this is what the BJP would do, right? Anything that uh, involves two religions, they will try and make it into some uh, issue that is beyond what it may actually be, which is an issue involving two individuals, all right? And um, so, so basically, I do not see anyone having mishandled it. I think action will be taken according to the law as quickly as possible. In this case, uh, it's uh, the Congress corporator who is uh, the father of uh, uh, Neha. So there are BJP senior leaders who is going and, you know, meeting the family members. So what has been, uh, uh, you know, the efforts that have been made from the Congress side as a political party, as a party? Congress has also reached out to the bereaved family and we are, we share their pain. And uh, uh, coming to uh, back to the Congress key guarantees, uh, the five guarantees that uh, the Congress party had given in the assembly elections, uh, some of them have been, uh, you know, implemented too. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is this constant criticism that, uh, you know, it's causing huge amount of money to the state exchequer. So, how, as an economist, how do you, uh, you know, explain to people as to what exactly the Congress is doing? Because giving guarantees is easy, but when it comes to implementation, the kind of money that is involved is something which is huge. So, what do you have to say? So, the first part is, you know, why have we given these guarantees? In 10 years of Modi Sarkar, we've had price rise without incomes rising commensurately. So, if prices have doubled in 10 years, but your income has remained stagnant, you're only able to afford half of what you were able to afford 10 years earlier. Now, that means that we need to provide some kind of help to those who are in distress. And that's what these guarantees are about. Extra uh, food, uh, grains, extra uh, income and, um, you know, free bus travel and things like that. The other issue, of course, is that they haven't, you know, uh, the uh, job creation has been a failure under Prime Minister Modi. And large numbers of our youth, the supposed demographic dividend, are floundering and wondering what happened to their future, what happened to their hopes. And so that's why we brought in the Yuvanidhi project in Karnataka. Now, in the central manifesto, we promised much more. The Mahalakshmi uh, scheme offers one lakh per year to uh, women head of households. And the apprenticeship uh, right you know, guarantees of first job experience, right? So what we are doing is coming up with carefully thought through, um, e even if uh, expensive uh, programs, which pay attention to people's distress and provide a solution to overcome those problems that they face. Now, is this economically feasible? For at the national level, yes, we are a fastest growing economy and we have, we're already providing free food, uh, you know, grains to 83 crore people today. Why? Because not everyone is moving forward in, in the same manner as you and I who have done well in uh, the modern economy. Now, you think about what happens when you give people uh, more resources, right? Now, people don't hoard it, they spend it. When you spend uh, money, you have consumption. Consumption drives, has a multiplier impact. It's called Keynesian multiplier effect. And when this happens, growth picks up. When growth picks up, taxes and revenues pick up. But these revenues will be more than sufficient to take care of these guarantees. Then, in places like Karnataka, where Bengaluru is one of the most happening and fast-growing regions, um, you know, the, the growth will be even more spectacular. Most importantly, you know, people, when they're in distress, are also disillusioned. They are dispirited. Um, they are uh, badly in need of 
some kind of a boost to their self confidence if you look over the last few years when you look at people in the labor force you'll see that people have been dropping out of the labor force see the term unemployment means you're looking for a job but not finding it enough people dropping out of the workforce itself because they're you know they really have no hope we have to restore hope we have to restore confidence we have to help people stand on their feet again and think about working towards a better future that's what our guarantees are and that you know psychological impact of our of our timely and crucial uh, uh, you know help is going to really make a difference to our growth overall yeah and talking about uh, bengaluru there are a host of issues that uh, uh, you know the city is facing uh, particularly the water crisis do you think that this water crisis will impact the chances of congress in bengaluru no people know that we're going through one of the worst droughts people know that um, a lot of the lakes that have not been filled with water have been desilted or have been in the process of being desilted for 2 3 4 years under the previous bjp government which never finished that work that's because they keep taking 40% commission and not you know leaving enough resources for the actual project and um you know so so we are aggressively um moving forward to um, address that so that when the rains come we will have more than sufficient storage capacity we are um, working to uh, you know end the tanker mafia we made sure that it's not just the rich who can afford to get hold of um, uh, water tankers but we are making sure that everyone uh, from the poorest to the poor gets access to this fundamental need water and then we are also working on other you know proactive measures you know we pushing rainwater harvesting pushing apartment complexes to have um, you know multiple plumbing lines one for drinking water and another for reusable treated water we are um, you know those apartments that can afford and uh, are of a certain scale we are asking them to uh, use their um, uh, stp treated water of high quality for to be asking them to sell that for industrial purposes so we are um, and we are putting in a lot of effort you know through the bengaluru climate action plan to um, ensure that our um, uh, keres and kalways lakes and canals are protected that they are um, not contaminated there's a huge amount of effort um, that we have already started and when i have been going around the constituency i have been able to see first hand where the contamination is where various kinds of interventions can be made and now already some of the lakes like kingeri you know that we've started filling with water soon we will see more um uh, you know more more recharge of uh, shallow aquifers we will see much more efforts on our part to um create recharge points everywhere so that ultimately you know the uh, we get, and and we get enough rain in this city usually um to last us if we wanted to we've got okay. instead we find it much easier to just depend on kaveri water or something like that very costly and um so given all this i think we are uh, on track to be able to cope with this crisis if you recall when it comes to water management in the previous uh, sidramayya led congress government we had um introduced the kesi valley and um uh, hebal nagwara valley uh, you know sort of um, lake um, uh, rejuvenation uh, projects where treated wastewater from bengaluru was pumped up into a very different watershed and um, and and you know essentially was is going to be greening kolar and chipadapur districts which are um, where a lot of our horticultural produce comes from so we've shown that kind of imagination okay and so when it comes to water you can trust us you know in a matter of months we will you know we will find a way to address these issues and we will also uh, bring in kaveri phase 5 which is uh, close to completion the last time when i interviewed you you said uh, that there is no modi wave in bengaluru that was the time when modi had uh, the maximum number of rallies here during the assembly elections this time around i have been following quite a bit of your uh, campaign and you are saying the same thing because yeah. people vote differently for in assembly elections people vote differently in parliament elections particularly in bengaluru the last time they won 25 seats and uh, still modi is a is the most popular you know a prime minister that the country has and particularly in bengaluru too people 
you know um, he is very popular yeah prime minister modi is a popular leader but there are enough ways to counter by making sure that for example our candidate selection is good there are um, you know ground troops our party cadres are out there motivated and mobilizing the convincing voters to switch from their fascination for the marketing machine to us people who actually deliver and the guarantees we've shown that we care and we're making a difference to people's lives so i don't anticipate that there will be a modi way when if you actually think about the last couple of major general elections there was a modi way this time there isn't anything like that people are also seeing that you know if he talks about national security right what has he done about manipur you know manipur is a double engine bjp government at the center and state when manipur was on fire there was practically civil war going on there wasn't a word from the prime minister people see that and people are you know really disappointed so you know these sorts of things me uh, have um, uh, have basically when i talk to people they say well you know if there is a modi way which is really an anti modi way people are saying he gave him 10 years and he did not deliver and also talking about corruption uh, you know the last time we saw a campaign against the bjp 40% campaign uh, whereas uh, the congress is also talking about uh, the electoral bond scam uh, and uh, a lot of other issues related to that there is quick pro quo definitive uh, uh, you know there are, there are like news minute and news laundry and scroll has reported uh, how quick pro quo uh, has happened uh, in this electoral bond but uh, is, is this becoming an election issue are people talking about it is the congress taking it forward to the people making them understand because it's very complicated uh, issue uh, it's <laughs> corruption is not a complicated issue people understand many of them have suffered corruption right and so when you point out that for all the rhetoric of na khaunga na khane dunga what the bjp has been indulging through um, electoral bonds the unconstitutional illegal electoral bonds that they feasted on they were indulging in extortion they would send a company would face an et raid and the next day there would be a demand for um electoral bonds which which would ensure that the case would be closed okay that's called extortion that's what the bjp is indulging in and people are aware of that and the 40% sarkara uh, effect still very much remains people are very sure that the bjp people have not changed their stripes they are as corrupt as they ever were and it makes no sense to bring them back now you know on top of all this people have seen the non performance of the bjp it's like you know what did these 25 mp's do well, you know so basically um, did they stand up for karnataka's rights did they stand up for resources for karnataka nothing even now they're just campaigning saying vote for modi i'm j- they're just dummies right nobody wants dummy in peace they want people who actually deliver on the ground and in parliament and that's what you're not seeing from them at all so corrupt you know ineffective dummies enough that's what people are saying right so thank you so much for talking to us and all the very best for your uh, uh, election and i'll no, hope no, to no. see you no yeah. questions about my vision for the constituency yeah yeah, yeah that's what i have okay anyway we'll go ahead i i thought it's your uh, this thing is your we've reached, reached. Hmm? okay yeah, yeah. and also uh, tell me about your uh, vision for the constituency what do you want to do because so far you have been a rajya sabha mp you have been someone who has been uh, working behind the scenes you are uh, uh, someone who is a researcher so now what is your vision sir so one of the advantages of contesting a direct election is that you get to visit every part of the city and see how people live you understand the, the kind of effective governance and policy measures that they are that they are that they need of and so here basically we have focused on yeah so we are focused on making sure that bengaluru new Beng, no, north bengaluru which is the growing part of bengaluru mm-hmm. we, that we have better developmental agendas mm-hmm. uh, which is much more sustainable and um, uh, you know inclusive we want to make sure that issues that you asked about water and things like that become priorities we need to create movements 
to harvest uh, water, things of that sort. I've done a lot of work on traffic and public transport. I introduced metro feeder buses. I've fought for suburban rail. So I will be focusing on, you know, possibly introducing um, multi, um, uh, in a multimodal transit hub in Hebar so that the suburban rail and metro and bus stand and the highway all are connected and people find it easy to shift from one mode to another. So all these sorts of uh, solutions, but more than anything else, the aim is to improve um, the quality of life of every citizen. We want to make sure that we pay attention to their cultural life, more cultural centers, um, sports life. We want a healthy, fit city and so a lot more for sports facilities. So all these sorts of things are going to ensure that North Bangalore, you know, becomes a place which is what people think of when they think of Bangalore. A very peaceful, happy, productive, impactful, um, culturally rich, you know, part of uh, the city, part of the country, and one where, you know, people would just love to be a uh, resident. Right, sir. Thank you so much for talking to us. I'll see you on June 4th. Thank you. Look forward. This election season, your right to choose puts you at the heart of it again. We'd like to be your eyes and ears. Choose the journalism and media that serves democracy and you. Simply log on to newslaundry.com slash 2024 election fund and choose an amount of your choice for the reports of your choice.